My name is Natalie Walker. I'm the manager of college operations here at the Classic Learning Test. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the CLT, we're a college entrance exam and assessment suite for grades 7 through 12. One thing that distinguishes the CLT as a test is its content. Two thirds of the passages on any CLT exam come from our author bank. This is a list comprised of men and women who have contributed to the richness of philosophy and thought that we have inherited. These are authors you're likely to encounter in your college career for those students, and hopefully you'll engage with them throughout your life. So most Thursdays of the academic year to help us develop the true common canon, a faculty member from one of our partner colleges helps us explore one author from the CLT bank. Tonight, that author is Alexi de Tocqueville, and it is our second sem seminar this year with Ashland University. Uh, you can view our seminar with Ashland about Frederick Douglass on our YouTube page. As I did before that seminar, I want to highlight for you, especially CLT students and families, one particular program at Ashland, and that's the Ashbrook Scholar Program, which may be the finest liberal arts program in politics and history in the nation. It has a national reputation for the quality of the students it attracts and the superb faculty who teach them, the caliber of people coupled with a comprehensive liberal arts curriculum that emphasizes the reading of original historical texts and documents come together to form an undergraduate program that cannot be found anywhere else in the country. It is a rigorous program for serious public spirited students with a passion for civic leadership. Uh, the reading list is incredible and I'll put a link to it in the chat shortly for those with us live or you can find it in the YouTube description below. Um, before I introduce our distinguished lecturer or tonight more of a host it's a proper seminar i want to welcome some special guests on the call um, we're joined by a clt 10 award winner sasha and we're also joined by my friend micaiah who's been an excellent participant in all of our seminars this semester so thank you for joining us um, tonight especially and i think we're also joined by jacob another clt 10 award winner welcome jacob you will meet them shortly. Um, CLT test takers are always impressing me, and it's a pleasure to talk with you all tonight about a text as poignant and wonderful as this one. Now, Dr. Jeff Sakenga joined Ashland University in 1997. He is executive director of the Ashbrook Center and a professor of political science. He has also served as president and vice president of the faculty senate at Ashland. He earned his PhD and MA from University of Toronto and his BA from University of Virginia. He has been a senior fellow in the Program on Constitutionalism and Democracy at UVA, a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and the William E. Simon Distinguished Visiting Professor at the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. He has lectured across the country on religious liberty, American politics, and the Supreme Court, and he is the author of a number of reviews, articles, and book chapters on political thought, constitution, politics, and religion. His favorite thing about Ashland is his great faculty colleagues and the intellectual and moral character of the students. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sakenga. We're so grateful to have you here. Uh, screen is yours. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you, Natalie, and with all, all the students and folks here. Uh, it's a privilege for me to take be able to take some time this evening um, because it's always good to talk about Alexis de Tocqueville and what he has to say. Uh, it's one of those books I teach a a senior seminar for our Ashbrook Scholars. You mentioned the Ashbrook Scholar Program. They all have to take a senior capstone seminar uh, called Human Being and Citizen. And we usually focus just on one classic text and walk, work all the way through it from beginning to end. And this past year and several previous years, that text has been Tocqueville's Democracy in America. And I always tell the students that you will never see the world the same way again once you've read Tocqueville you will just see things that you didn't see before and understand things you didn't understand before, especially if we study it carefully together. So it, it's just, it always rewards careful, close study and thoughtful reading. So I thought it would be a good text uh, for us to talk about a little this evening. Um, I, I guess we could start by just who was Tocqueville? Uh, probably many of you know this, but he was a 19th century French aristocrat uh, who was born in 1805, uh, died relatively young age in 1859. Uh, he was particularly interesting because he was both a thinker and a doer. He, he was, uh, of course, Democracy in America, 
the, the translation by Harvey Mansfield and Delbert Winthrop was terrific. And I think it's the selection that you have. That's probably his most famous book, but he did write other works. Um, he wrote a history of the French Revolution uh, called The Ancien Regime and the French Revolution. He wrote uh, other works uh, for sort of deep political philosophy, but also for the public and the immediate political press. And then he also served in politics. He was a member of the French National Assembly, and even for a little while, pretty high up in the French government. And he was he witnessed a lot of uh, really fundamentally important events during the 19th century in France and more broadly in Europe. Of course, he postdates the French Revolution, but he's very familiar with the French Revolution, his aristocratic family having been uh, to some degree persecuted by the revolution. And then he's there also for the really important moment in 1848, where there are sort of liberal revolutions, democratic revolutions across Europe. So he's well placed to see what he calls on the very first page of our reading, the great democratic revolution. He's he's an aristocrat. He's lit, he, his, he comes out of that lineage, but he has seen the movement in Europe toward democracy. And so he's uniquely well placed, I think, to be able to show us the virtues and the vices of democracy, show us the advantages, the disadvantages, the good and the bad. And it's a unique perspective because, he, as he makes it clear, people who live in democracy don't normally think about democracy. They just live democracy. They just do democracy. They don't really reflect on it. So he offers us the beginning of the book, an opportunity to seriously reflect on what democracy is, and maybe even more um, significantly, what it means to be a democratic human being and live shaped profoundly by democracy in ways that we probably don't even understand fully. So it's good. It's interesting as sort of political science, but it's really interesting study of ourselves as democratic human beings and our virtues and our vices and how that's similar to different from better than and even worse than um, aristocratic human beings in aristocracy. Um, so uh, if we could just begin, I don't know, I'm happy to read, but if there's somebody out there that wants to just start by reading, I think it's always a great way when we're encountering these classic texts to just read out loud. Um, it's so important to read out loud. If you don't do that, please do. Just start making it a habit. We always ask our students in class to read out loud and then just talk about a passage. Um, it engages all of your senses, right? You can speak it, you hear it, you see it. Um, the words, you can get a flavor for the rhythm of the language and the words. And you can't, if you mess up, a word when you speak out loud and you read out loud, you know it immediately. If you skim through it really quickly, you can just glide through stuff without fully slowing down and getting the meaning of it. So as always with these classic texts, I always say, um, just slow down, take some bites, chew it up, digest it, and move on. So um, I don't know if someone would like to start reading at the beginning uh, of this. If we're reading Tocqueville together, we're all friends. So you're among friends. Um, is that at Among the New Objects? Sorry, yes, it I'm is. Thank you. All right. Um, is there somewhere you want me to stop reading? Um, I'll just stop you. All right. Among the new objects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States, none struck my eye more vividly than the equality of conditions. I discovered without difficulty the enormous influence that this primary fact exerts on the course of society. It gives a certain direction to public spirit, a certain turn to the laws, new maxims to those who govern, and particular habits to the governed. Soon I recognized that this same fact extends its influence well beyond the political Morrison laws, and that it gains no less dominion over civil society than over government. It creates opinions, gives birth to sentiments, suggests usages, and modifies everything it does not produce. Oh, very good, thank you, Sasha. Uh, what strikes you all about these first two paragraphs? A word, a phrase, a thought, what, what strikes you? First thing that comes to mind for me is the point on the quality of conditions. As an aristocrat living in Paris, he was very familiar with the 
the, the gap between the very, very rich and the very, very poor during this time. So it's, I find this thing interesting that he pointed out. Yeah, right. So there's, and of course, it, it in some ways raises the question, what does he mean by equality of conditions, right? What does he mean by conditions? Because one aspect of that is definitely economic condition, right? Relative amounts of income and wealth. That's clearly comprehended under conditions. Um, what else do you think he might mean by conditions? My my history of the French Revolution is somewhat rusty, but if I remember correctly, there was an issue with the people had a parliament and then it like wasn't a lot. There was some drama with it not being allowed to have a vote or something. And especially in our in the Democratic Republic that it is America when, okay, not everybody, but a lot of people had a vote and not just those who were aristocratic or, you know, the Virginian legacy of... <laughs> the plantation owners, and it would have been striking for him to go and see, huh, this person doesn't have a day in front of their name, but they still have political power and influence. Absolutely, right? So there's exactly right. So there's economic condition, but there's also political condition. Who gets to vote? Who gets to hold office? Who gets to serve on juries? All, all of those kind of things. So there's economic conditions, there's political conditions. Um, you, we might add to that uh, social condition. It refers that, in, in chapter eight, it says some similar things about like kind of the uniformity of general thought and action. And just how it says in the next, the next paragraph, like how it permeated all realms of society. So I think it was just a general overall mindset as well. That's, that's really good because it's economic condition, it's political condition, it might be social condition and standing, but also Tocqueville makes clear, you're right, intellectual condition, educational condition. For example, he remarks later in the book, um, he was amazed that almost everybody that he met in America could read, but very few of them read pro many profound things. So it's like the general level is, is higher, but also lower. In fact, later on he in the book, he actually recommends reading classic texts, especially Greeks and Romans. To, to sort of elevate our education. But he says, so educationally, there's a lot of similarity in America. Uh, for example, everyone reads, in part, he says that comes out of their democratic condition, also out of their religious condition. Many of them are sort of Protestant Puritans who, for whom reading the Bible is essential. And so everyone is taught to read so they can read the Bible for themselves. So you've got economic condition, political condition, social condition, uh, the example that he gives of social condition is um, if someone greets you in America, you're just walking down the sidewalk or something and you you getting close to them and you see them. He says everybody in America greets each other. And if any of you live out in, in the country, if you're ever driving down country roads. I live here in Ashland, Ohio. It's a pretty rural area out in, in, in the county. If you drive down a country road, you kind of have to wave to somebody as you go by. And if you're like in your school, if you're in a school and you see people who are your kind of acquaintances, but not close friends, you kind of feel like you kind of have to say hi. That's an equality of social condition. You feel like you have to acknowledge them. Why? Because they're your equal. And if they don't acknowledge you, you think to yourself, wait, what, who do they think they are? That's the equality of social condition. Doesn't mean there isn't differences, but there's a kind of fundamental uh, equality, intellectual condition, political condition. Um, later on, he'll actually say a, a kind of moral condition that Americans are in. There's an equality of that. So he says condition is not just um, a, a formal thing. It's the whole state of human beings in all of their manifest characteristics, their economic characteristics, their political, their social, their intellectual, their educational and he also says even religious, there's a similarity in equality of condition, okay? And that's what struck him. He said, nothing struck me more than that. What else strikes you about these first two paragraphs? Yeah. 
he talks about how it's not just I mean, you, you sort of talked about this before, but it's not just in the, it's not just something that's particularly always manifested. It's always in their mindset, though. It's always something that they're thinking, even if they're not saying it. Yeah, right. Do you, when you greet somebody, do you think ahead of time, let's see, should I greet this person? You just say, hey, how are you? You don't even think about it. Hey, what's up? What's up? That's not, you don't, it's just, you're right. You don't it never even consider it. On the note of greeting, I don't know if any of you have spent time in Europe, I was born in Germany, and something that's very striking about America compared to European countries is that, yeah, there's this very, like, chatty, hi, how are you attitude. If you go to Germany and, like, ask a stranger, hi, how are you, they're going to give you a look that's kind of like, and then if you get unlucky, they're going to tell you how they really are doing and to unload their day on you. And that does strike me as, like, in America, because we have the sense of, like, equality or we're all equals, we have the ability to walk up to a stranger and be like, hey, yo, how are you doing? And there's not this expectation that you're gonna totally unload your day. There's this expectation that rather than our serious questions and acknowledgement, that we have the ability to say these things casually to one another. And in fact, I think if, if, someone, if someone actually did stop and start saying, telling us how their day was, we would think, what, who is this weirdo, right? Why, why are they taking up our time? Another thing Tocqueville says about democratic human beings is, they're always busy. They're always doing stuff. They don't have leisure. They don't even even when they're not busy, they're thinking about the next thing they have to do. So like as soon as this is done, you all are going to check your phones to see who contacted you. What and then you're going to check your schedules and see what you need to do. Cuz Americans are always busy being busy. Yeah. Um that that's exactly right. So that that carries over even in, as you said into that kind of greeting. What what else did you notice? The lists strike me. We get two different lists and we ourselves, when we were defining, trying to define the, what does he mean when he says equality of conditions? We started listing things. So different, different ways we're inf influenced by equality of conditions, but I'm just looking at the sentence, I discovered without difficulty the enormous influence that this primary fact, equality of conditions, exerts on the course of society. And then he gives a list, maybe a little bit similar to ours, like economic, um, political, et cetera. So I wonder, um, I think we have a great working definition, but I just wonder if it means something more singular to him or to us, like what is the first what is the first equality for us Americans that kind of dictates the others? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really good question. What do we think about that? What's the first, what, what equality matters most to you all? Do you mean like mindset of equality or like results of equality? Um, yeah, yeah, what um, I could ask to put it the other way. What inequality bothers you the most? Be kind of what um, Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. We know that like, you know, some people are better at some things than others in their lives, but it doesn't change the fact that from our birth, we are all humans. And it personally bothers me a lot when we treat people badly for something they can't control. Of course, there are things that people can control that they ought to face consequences for, but something, you know, like skin color, gender, et cetera, are all, it's, you have, you have nothing, it's not your fault, you have nothing to do with it. And I find it concerning when people are like, hey, you're lesser because of that. Yeah, that's actually one thing Tocqueville remarks about Americans. He says that uh, I met rich people in America, he says, but the rich people in America, most of them actually started poor or their parents started poor. So they 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 have a kind of attachment or at least very modest, modest means. So they don't they don't act like aristocrats. They might have nicer stuff than other people, but they don't act like aristocrats. And he says, I met people who were kind of from well-established families, but even they did not act like aristocrats. Um, he even remarks that in the America, what was remarkable to him about the American Revolution is that the, 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 the gentry, 
the, the Thomas Jeffersons, the George Washingtons, the James Madisons of the world, the John Adams, they sided with the people in the revolution against the British. So he says, even politically, there was kind of an identification with uh, a kind of egalitarianism pervaded that. Yeah, and I think one thing that Tocqueville says later is, one thing Americans can't stand, they can, they can, it's okay if people, if someone's better than you at something, it's okay if someone's got more money than you, it's okay that if they've got things that you don't have, but he says the one thing Americans can't stand is if they think they're better than you. Just like better as a human being, and the way you put it is a superior human being and an inferior human being who therefore you can treat worse. He says, that's the core thing that democratic people later on, he says, they love equality. He says they, they like freedom, but they love equality. And so they hate that inequality where someone thinks they're better than you. It's okay if someone's richer than you, as long as they don't think they're better than you. It's okay if someone's better at, than you at you know, basketball or something, as long as they don't think they're, they're better than you and you're, they're, they're your superior and they can tell you what to do. That's the thing he says that drives democratic people really crazy. That's what they hate. It's a certain particular habits of the govern, a certain turn up to the laws. Um, Natalie pointed us to that passage, right? That's actually the table of contents for the first volume. If you if you read it, the, the book was published in, the work was published in two volumes. Uh, one, he, Tocqueville came in 1831 to the United States to visit, toured for nine months, published the first volume in 1835, and then the second volume five, five years later. And he has this, uh, published in French originally, uh, not translated into English into in America for actually a number of years. So it was really for a European audience. But that's the table of contents for the first volume. The second paragraph really is the table of contents for the second volume. Um, in, and I'll just read it again to give you a sense of what he covers in the second volume. Soon I recognize that this same fact, equality of conditions, extends its influence well beyond political mores and laws. That's the first volume. And that it gains no less dominance over civil society than over government. It creates opinions, gives birth to sentiments, suggests usages, and modifies everything it does not produce. Uh, it, it's a really remarkable paragraph when you think about it. Democracy creates opinions. Equality of conditions creates opinions so that you actually, because we live in a democratic society, you actually think thoughts that people in aristocracy did not think. Which is a kind of, wait, what? What thought, I mean, think about it. what thoughts do you have that someone in an aristocracy might never, might never have crossed their mind? Social mobility is the first thing that comes to mind. Go, what do you mean by that? Uh, if you're in, you're in an aristocracy, you, like if you're born in a noble place, like that, that's what you're going to be for the rest of your life, right? You're going to be a noble. If you're born a, a peasant, one of the plebeians, then you have very little chance of reaching a higher position because that's just not how aristocracies work because they're based on bloodlines of birth rather than merit. In a democracy, we have the ability to, to rise above our station, there's this sense of the self-made man, which is not entirely correct in that everybody requires help in order to become something else. But we do have the ability to go from an immigrant in the middle of the Caribbean to treasury secretary, stuff like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Like the opinion, the thought, I can do anything I put my mind to. I can become anything. A that's a ridiculous idea to an aristocrat. No, you can't. <laughs> in fact, if you think about people's last names, especially if they came from England, a lot of people's last names, Smith, Miller, Baker, it tells you exactly what their station in life is and what their ancestors did and what they're going to do and what they're always going to do in an aristocracy. Right. Whereas aristocratic names, if you notice, like de Tocqueville, it's the name of a place. It's not the name of an occupation because aristocrats inhabit a landed property and a place, and they're of that place, the peasants are the thing they do. Miller, Baker, Smith, right? Yeah, so that's in one idea. 
uh, I can be anything I set my mind to. Uh, what else? What other ideas do you think we have? Opinions. This is sort of similar, but just the concept of being able to be different things rather than just like moving up the social ladder. But like the fact that at any given school, you know, there's a basketball team, there's a debate club, there's a drama team, just the ability to not only move up the social ladder, but be different on the same level have different interests and different like like because as you were saying like bakers they're going to be bakers their sons are going to be bakers their grandsons are going to be bakers whereas in america like the very concept of college majors it's like we have a choice in who we are but it can all be at the same level as well right right very interesting other opinions other well, other opinions that you have One that Tocqueville remarks on very interesting, he calls it the philosophic method of the Americans. Um, and he has, a, it's an interesting discussion. He says, probably some of you know uh, the French philosopher René Descartes, as, and some of you have read him or you certainly will read him in college, uh, and particularly if you're a philosophy major. But um, he says, Americans have never read Descartes. They've never even heard of Descartes, but they are all Cartesians. And he says, so what does that mean? He says, uh, what it means is they, they go by the philosophy of think for yourself. That you figure out stuff for yourself. That he says, traditions, he says, they just receive, traditions are sort of like helpful information, not binding contracts with the dead. That's how aristocrats see traditions. They really see themselves as linked through these traditions to their ancestors and to betray the tradition is to betray their ancestors. So they have to maintain it. He says, democratic people are like, well, I know my mom, you know, has ham for Christmas, but I don't know when we start our family, we're going to have turkey. That, that you think, wow, that's a whole, no, democratic people think, well, okay, if that's what you want to do. They think that they can, they just take tradition as information. Um, other opinions, they think for themselves, he says they they even think for themselves in very serious matters like politics and like religion. Or he says at least they think they think for themselves. Uh, he says what often happens is they end up following public opinion. So what how you dress you think you you think you get to decide how you dress, but you don't really. I mean, if your school has uniforms, then of course you have someone on external form telling you <laughs> what you need to wear within the bounds, right, of what you can wear. But you think if your school doesn't have uniforms, you can wear whatever you want. There you go, right? <laughs> you can wear whatever you want, or you think, well, but out in society, when I'm away from school, I can wear whatever I want. It's true, but the amazing thing Tocqueville says is you end up dressing like everybody else. He says, it's an amazing, powerful, homogenizing force, public opinion in America. But everybody has the opinion, I can run my own life and do my own thing. In fact, one of the things he encourages is read great texts and classical works because it will free you from enslavement to public opinion. Because you'll meet authors like Aristotle or Plato or Frederick Douglass or Tocqueville who liberate your mind from the immediate and the conventional. And, but he says, that's a very powerful force in democracy. You think you think for yourself, but you don't necessarily. Um, sentiments, gives birth to sentiments. We feel things as democratic people that aristocratic people didn't feel. Uh, well, any thoughts on what those might be? Is it sort of like um, sometimes Sorry, sometimes when you're, you'll almost feel more compassionate for somebody if you feel like you have a stronger sense of what you feel like they deserve. Like you feel like what they deserve is exactly equal to what you deserve or what this person who you think is in the same social station as them deserves. And so if they're not getting for that, you're going to feel more compassionate. Meanwhile, an aristocrat would never really feel compassion for 
a plebeian or a peasant because he wouldn't feel the need to. He would recognize that as their station, as with the peasant. Yeah, that's a really good point, Jacob. Uh, in fact, that's what the, Tocqueville actually says that democratic people are very compassionate people because, because they're equal. If someone experiences a misfortune in a democracy, you can imagine that's you experiencing that misfortune, right? Because they're not fundamentally different beings. You think, well, if it could happen to them, like, wow, a tornado came and destroyed someone's house. Boy, some natural disaster could really hurt me too. And you feel bad for them. You feel compassion. So he says, democratic societies are much more compassionate societies than aristocratic societies. And in fact, one part of the book, he actually has a letter from an aristocratic woman to her daughter where she jokes about um, the town uh, police catching a peasant who just stole something very minor and breaking him on the wheel. And she jokes about it as though it's just casual. And then the next sentence is, oh, and, and Madame Defarge's um, uh, flowers are lovely this time of year. It's really like the casual cruelty of, arist of aristocracy um, is not, uh, it's not in play in democracy. People are much more compassionate. But he also says what's interesting is they're more compassionate, but they're less devoted that like um if you've ever seen movies or tv shows about aristocracy like they have a they have an oath that they've taken to some lord and some the knight has to serve that lord and they even have to die for that person because they took an oath for them it says that so on the one hand they're less compassionate but they're more devoted to particular people and particular things and he says, democratic people are really not, don't feel self-sacrificing devotion to anything except their immediate family and maybe a tiny small circle of friends. And you'd, I just, you'd have to think about your own life. Like to, to whom do you feel, to which specific people, individuals, do you feel an obligation that you would have to give up your time, your energy, your money, part of your day, something like that. Do you have anything like that outside of your immediate family and, and very, very close friends? Because if you do, Tocqueville says, it's probably because you're a member of some kind of group. Like, yeah, I would really sacrifice for my friends on the blank team, on the debate team or on the basketball team or whatever it is. Or I would really sacrifice my time for my for my friends at church, my church, people I go to church with or some something like that kind of association. He says that is like what aristocrats feel. So we can we can have that kind of devotion, but it almost has to be created in democratic society because we don't naturally have it. Naturally, if we hear about a flood somewhere across the uh, other side of the globe, we feel bad for a little bit. The news covers it for about two nights and then it just disappears. And people will, you know, do some online donation or they'll give money to a GoFundMe page or something. And then they just kind of forget, forget about it and go about their lives. So you've talked a little bit about like these fundamental values of Americans and compared them those in a democracy to those in an aristocracy. Obviously, the Americans spent a lot a while under a parliamentary monarchy, which is pretty different from the democratic republic they then became. Do you think there was something in the American people that inherently predisposed them to be inclined to democracy or was it a shift that happened as the country and the government shifted? Oh, that's a really good question. So this is an interesting place where I think Tocqueville kind of would disagree with some of our founders and some of our most important um, statesmen, if you think of Abraham Lincoln, for example, because Tocqueville really wants to make the case, you know, if you, there's a, a debate right now among historians and more broadly in public, what's what year was America founded, right? Traditionally, typically, it's been since 1776. Some of you know there's a, something called the 1619 Project, which tries to found America on six, in 1619 with the introduction of slaves in Virginia. Tocqueville actually dates the birth of America, he says, to the first Puritan who set foot on North America. So 1620. Tocqueville thinks America was really founded in 1620, and its democratic birth happened there 
and strengthened as it went along. And his argument is the American Revolution did not create democracy in America. It let it out of all the things that were containing it. The British imperial system was containing American democracy, but it was, it was not, it had aristocratic elements to it. But once the British were overturned, most of those aristocratic elements were gone, like re, uh, restriction on suffrage, for example, at least universal male suffrage. And in fact, he says, if there's any aristocratic elements in America, they almost all come from British traditions. So if you, if you ever watch C-SPAN and watch the House of Representatives or the Senate, and they talk in a little bit kind of a formal way when they address each other, that's straight out of the British Parliament, right? We've inherited these things. Uh, our criminal justice system, right, inherited from the British mostly, has aristocratic elements to it. Like you stand up when the judge comes in the room, in the courtroom, right? That's, you have to call him your honor, whether or not he's honorable, uh, you have to say that, right? Because it's the office that they occupy. That those are those are British traditions. He says, but outside of that British tradition, America was from the very beginning democratic and just got more and more democratic over time. See, my not quite an argument against that, but my point against that would be that the Revolutionary War was not really a not not most people didn't consider it a war against monarchy. It was a war against what they considered to be British oppression. But many people thought that after the Revolutionary War that George Washington would take over the position as a king and ruler. And that's why people were so shocked when he stepped down. And that seems to me as a point that it wasn't about a natural democracy. It was simply that because America was founded on this desire for freedom from oppression that that led to democracy, but not because Americans were inherently predisposed as we can see from the amount of people that supported the British during the Revolutionary War. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think if you think of the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the first line is four score and seven years ago, right? He dates the founding of America to 1776. And he says, our fathers brought forth a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So Lincoln definitely wants to, to date the founding of America as 1776 in the Declaration. And American critics, when they read Tocqueville's book, they actually raised the point that you did, Sasha, which is Tocqueville doesn't say a word about the Declaration of Independence in the entire book. He says almost nothing about the American Revolution as a really important moment. In fact, one, at one place, he says, ah, revolutions happen all the time. Compared to the French Revolution, the American Revolution was no big deal. And by the way, the Americans never would have won without the French. So don't make a big deal out of the American Revolution. <laughs> but, but I think it is true that he doesn't um, he doesn't really give much significance to the declaration and the principles that it articulates there. And, and Americans themselves have criticized him for sort of not seeing that or not understanding the importance of that fact. But he's pretty sure America started in 1620. It's interesting because he seems to be focusing while any American would be focusing on the country itself, more on the mindset of the Americans. So what it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, but what he's saying in the Americans founded in 1620, that was when this mindset was given birth to by this Puritan and all of his peers as they came ashore, as they were seeking freedom from religious oppression, they were the first of this mindset. And they were the seed that spread it throughout the nation, even though the nation itself, as, as a literal nation, was created in 1776, the mindset, the, the seed of this nation was from 1620. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. That's right. And so his, from his mind, in his argument, 1776 is really the extension of 1620. It's kind of the, the political... Um, bringing about of the mindset of 60, so it was started in 1620. That's exactly right. That's how he would think about it. And, and he says that mindset, some other sentiments that he talks about, he says Americans, the democratic people love equality, Americans do. Uh, and he says that can be good or it can be bad because what it, it, it can be good because it, there is a kind of equality that raises everyone. Right. So we're equal. So you should strive to, to raise yourself. Um, 
there is another kind of equality that Tocqueville says, a bad equality that tries to bring down people. So it says to the excellent, you have to be mediocre. It says to the strong, you need to be weak. It says to the rich, you should be poor. Um, he says that's a, that's a bad kind of equality because he makes clear in the beginning of the book, the real purpose of the whole book is to what, do, what he calls preserve human greatness because he's very worried in aristocracy, there's a huge concern with human greatness. In fact, they kind of overdo it. They glorify greatness all the time and they forget about all the other virtues and qualities that you should have in society, but they really focus on human greatness. They love human greatness. They, they worship human greatness, even if they misunderstand what it really is. Often aristocrats think human greatness is military glory or opulent wealth. It's like, that's not really the sum of human greatness. But in democracy, Tocqueville's worried that human greatness itself will be suspected. That people won't want, they'll be like, hmm, I don't, human greatness implies that some people are better than other people or more excellent in some way. That doesn't sit well with us. And Tocqueville's very worried, he says, to preserve that idea and that principle in a democratic age. He's aware that it can't be the same as aristocracy, but to preserve it as much as possible. So he's very concerned about the sentiments that would bring down human greatness or would impede people's pursuit of greatness. Um, uh, the other sentiment that he talks about, which I think really interesting, is the sentiment which he calls individualism. And it's it's really interesting because it's not what we would think. When we think of individualism, we might think, you know, like the ability or the freedom of an individual to do things for themselves. Or, you know, the, a rugged individualism in Herbert Hoover's phrase. Um, when Tocqueville says individualism, he says it's not a an opinion. He actually says it's a feeling, a sentiment. And he says it's probably the most dangerous sentiment to our humanity in all of all of those that are created by democracy, because he says it's a it's a, a feeling of uh, uh, being isolated from your fellow uh, human beings, from your fellow citizens. And he says in aristocracy, there is no such thing as individualism because you are a part of a family that has gone on for generations before and will go on for generations after you. In democracy, you live in the here and now. You're disconnected from your ancestors and you're really disconnected from the people who are gonna come after you. And he says, the danger is also that you're disconnected from the people around you. And he says, it's a very worrisome problem. It can be combated. And he says, the Americans have done a great job in combating this feeling, but um, it's a, always a constant danger and the tendency to isolate yourself. And he says, it comes from the fact that um, you think that you can do it for yourself. So why do you need other people? You also think, tend to think you have to do it for yourself because not too many of us have famous last names that we can rely on. Like once you get out of college, you actually have to get a job. You actually have to go do stuff, right? Unless you have inherited wealth or some social standing or position, uh, you actually have to make something of your life. So it tends, Tocqueville says, to focus just on yourself. And he says that's very dangerous for us politically because we we're not engaged citizens. He says it's also very dangerous for us socially because we're naturally sociable creatures who should be with each other in conversation and friendship and, and in community. And we can withdraw from that. And he says it's very dangerous morally because it can lead to selfishness and a kind of absorption with yourself that takes you away from concern and care for other people. And he says, sometimes it just is like a slip of the tongue. Like if you get, if, if you get married and you're gonna have children, what's the phrase that, peop, that we use for say having children? So a, a couple gets married, First, believe me, I experienced this when we, when my wife and I got married. First question is, you know, when are you gonna have children? That's the, that's that was my mother-in-law. First question, when are you gonna have children? Um, <laughs> but it's the phrase we use is, when are you gonna start a family? Okay, 
to our democratic ears, that sounds like a pretty normal question. To an arist aristocratic ears, it's a ridiculous question. Why is that? Well, they they think of their family as their ancestry, their ongoing past, rather than the future. Right. So that you don't start a family. You're part of a family and you continue. And when you have children, you're producing heirs for the family to continue the family line. You, and I, go ahead. Sorry, please. So what I find very interesting about Tocqueville's whole point here is that he's like, well, the, the Americans, the, the, the those who live in a democracy have this very like human focused worldview, tend to be more individualistic. And I'm sitting here thinking and I'm like, this sounds an awful lot like like humanism during the Renaissance, which was not ex it's like this philosophy doesn't feel like it was something new when the Americans started doing it. So then I guess the question is, is was there a, was there something that separated the philosophers in the, during the, hum the period of humanism, like Mirandola, Thomas More, from the Americans? Is there a difference, or is it just a Oh, it's a great question. Um, Tocqueville actually says in one one part of the book that um, democracy is part of the what he calls the modern intellectual movement, which he traces back to exactly that period. He says so that it started there. the The full fruition of this idea and the political fruition of this idea is America and American democracy. So, because he says there are still other elements, like even in humanism it still operates within the framework of an aristocratic society, right? So you still have the social bonds and the political connections of aristocracy. It still operates within a very clear um, uh, religious framework, for example, right? There's, there, and, and that doesn't exist like an established church that does not exist in America. So he does see it as the kind of end of the continuum that starts in that early modern period. And he talks about some of the people like Luther, Descartes, Voltaire, who are all part of what he calls that modern intellectual movement. Question. This is kind of more abstract, but uh, like there's there is a difference between like equality and sameness, so to speak. Like, for example, if every single person in the world was made to do like um, sports related extracurriculars that would be sameness but it's but what we think of as equality is like different types of a bit like for each person's ability so like I feel like that has to do with what you were saying earlier about individualism and like I guess the less toxic part, but just like accounting for people's differences I guess so yeah. can I say something about that please um, it's interesting because I feel like uh, you touched a bit on this earlier. Um, he says, I believe he says later in Democracy in America, he talks about how Americans prize equality so much more than liberty. And I feel like now in more modern America, it's descended even more into we're not even valuing equality. We're valuing the sameness, yes. as she said. And I just, I just feel like that's interesting. I feel like he would he would certainly draw some interesting conclusions from America today in that sense. Yeah, and it's interesting because Tocqueville actually says that um, it, equality properly understood does, does really bring goods with it. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, in the reading on page 675, he says uh, toward the bottom of the page in the right column over here, he says, it is no longer a question of retaining the particular advantages that inequality of conditions procures for men, but of securing the new goods that equality can offer them. So he's not a simple hater of democracy. He's like, no, 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 no. First of all, there is no aristocracy has gone. It's dying and it's dead and it's not coming back. The whole rest of the future for humanity is democracy. That's the future. We can't fight against that. And there he's speaking to the sort of reactionary factions in Europe that want to try to restore aristocracy or monarchies. Like that's past. It's a lost battle. Don't even fight that battle. But, but he says, but democracy can bring with it good or bad, good and bad. And our job is to maximize the good and minimize the bad. 
And the, the good, some of the goods that democracy does secure is what you were saying, which is the opportunity for people to pursue what is really good for them or pursue excellence in the way that they are particularly habituated for. Like you can join the debate team and you're a really good debater. And so you can do that and you have that and you're not forced into being on the basketball team when you don't like basketball and you're not very good at it. Or, but you're free to join the debate team. You don't have to have a certain last name to be on the team, right? So equality produces goods, definitely. Um, but it can also produce bads, like that because the tendency of the democratic mind, if it's not careful, is to confuse equality and sameness. Because every difference to the democratic mind, Tocqueville says, is suspicious because it might mean inequality. And so you have to constantly make the argument in defending freedom to say, ah, but it's equal opportunity. We're giving everyone the opportunity to be free and pursue what they're good at or what their excellence is um, and not dragging people down or making them the same. And he, he has a par 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 portion actually in the second volume where he talks about the family in America. And it's one of the places where he praises a democracy, probably some of the most in the whole book, because he says, um, have you all seen The Sound of Music? Do you know that? Have you seen the play or the movie with Julie Andrews? I think it's just a terrific movie. Um, if you remember the Von Trapp family before Maria gets there, it's Captain Von Trapp. He's very aristocratic, right? And all the children, he blows a whistle and the children come out and they line up. It's like a very, and it's a huge palatial home. It's very aristocratic and it's military hierarchy. Um, it's very cold, the relations between the father and the children. And then Maria comes and she's definitely the democratic character in the, in the uh, story. And she comes and she humanizes it and it becomes much warmer. And if you remember the aristocratic lady he was going to marry, she's very similarly cold and he kind of realizes my children need something like a, a mother who's warm. And so she starts, she has warm relations with them, but she also humanizes him and makes him have warm relations with his children. And at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, when he's playing Edelweiss, right? Uh, that beautiful song and singing, it's like, it's wow, how tender is this guy? Where was this before? Because he was this military aristocratic guy. Uh, I think it's uh, that Tofo would say that's one of the virtues of the demo that democracy brings, like the family. Because um, I don't, it, what you call your father, most people in democracy don't call their father sir. And if you do, it probably means that you either live in the South or your father is in the military or maybe in the police. But there's some, that's otherwise you call your father dad or daddy, or something like that, right? And Tocqueville like actually says, that's the natural way for children to talk to their fathers. Sir is artificially cold, but dad is in fact what your dad is, right? So, uh, but he says, that, but here's the danger. Democracy, the, too much democracy, too much equalizing conditions, under that, what do people, what do children call their father? What's the opposite extreme from sir? Their first name. Exactly. And Tocqueville's like, that's bad. That's unnatural. It's not, it's not according to how. So the danger with democracy is that we'll, it will try to equalize things in Tocqueville's mind that are not naturally equal. Or as Mark is telling us, bruh, right? <laughs> Calling your dad, bruh. Yeah, like it, it, when we think, well, it's kind of naturally disrespectful. Yeah, because it's not recognizing the natural difference and hierarchy between parents and children, right? And as you get older, you kind of move toward a kind of more equality with your parents over time, but it's a kind of natural movement. Sorry, Sasha, go ahead. So um, English does not differentiate anymore between the formal and informal you, but that is something that French does. They have the vous and the tu, right? And uh, I, go, I wonder then, I don't know if any of you know the answer, but if 
that would have affected Tocqueville's impressions on this, if there was a certain way that he would have been used to aristocratic children referring to their parents formally or informally. And then in America, you could also actually also make that an argument about the equalization, right? Because we no longer use the informal thou. We have reduced everybody to the formal you. And you could make that an interesting discussion about, but yeah, but anyways, like, do you think there's anything with that that Tocqueville was thinking about there? hundred percent. Yes, he has a whole chapter on how democracy has changed um, English in America. And one of the things he talks about is how informal uh, language is in democracy, right? So we don't have the thou anymore because it's undemocratic. We don't have tu and usted or tu and vous, as you said in French, right? Those are those languages still have that aristocratic flavor to it. And and if you know if you've been to Spanish speaking countries or French speaking places, if you use the wrong version, it's a huge social faux pas. And and that's also true in other languages like Japanese, where there are a part of aristocratic society. So one of the things Tocqueville says about American English is he says, they're always giving new meanings to the to old words. Hmm. So I have a 17 year old son who uses the word sick all the time, which does not mean <laughs> ill, like physically ill. In fact, it means the opposite. It's like, that's really good, right? Think about what a weird neologism that is. It's not even a neologism. It's just giving a new meaning to an old word. It says, in France, they actually have an academy, the Academy of Francaise, right, which decides which words are permitted in French. And ours is just totally free flowing. You just look it up on Urban Dictionary or somewhere, right? It's just like made up and you can just, and the word, the meaning of words changes all the time. It says that's democracy. It's equalizing language. And sometimes it's fun and interesting. And sometimes you're like, oh, but I weep for the loss of Shakespeare. Right. Then he says that's that's why he encourages Americans to read classic texts, because it will elevate them and kind of um, improve their one of the things that will improve their mind, but also improve their language and kind of ennoble their their hearts and think a little bit above the, the simple democratic world. But the but there is some warmth in the democratic family that exists. He says there's warmth between siblings. Uh, at least over time, as you get older, if you have siblings, and the thing you're always going to talk about is the memories you had together as a family. Uh, and he says, in aristocracy, siblings are basically members of the same corporation who secretly hate each other and just barely get along, what, which is not true in a democratic. So, so that's some of the sentiments that democracy gives birth to. And, and the other thing, there's just so many in the second volume, but one of the things he talks about is um, the military spirit in America and the revolutionary spirit, he says, don't mistake, because the French Revolution created democracy in France, don't think that democratic people are revolutionary. He says, they don't like revolutions because they're all about making money. That's another thing he says about the Americans. Democracy creates a love of material comfort. He says, Americans love making money. They love buying the latest conveniences and they love technology. And if, I, if you think about the place of the cell phone in our lives, like it is all of those things. It speaks to our, our we want uh, fast and easy and technological. It allows us to live in our own little world and not be engaged with anybody. You don't even have to watch TV in the same room with people anymore. You did in the old days. Uh, all of the, all these things tend, are, by equality of conditions, tend towards some of the vices of, of the democratic human being. So Topol again will say, have to be very careful when you do science. For example, he says, care about theoretical science, love some of the classics of science, and read those. Don't just be thinking about the latest cool app that you can make or you can have. Because you've, you've got to escape that. It, it produces amazing wealth and convenience, but the downside is a human downside. Um, and, yeah, please go ahead. Um, so kind of relating to what she was saying about like the, the linguistics of democracy almost. Um, so I read recently that a lot about America's ideology today is influenced by like the romantic poets and like their view on like getting back to nature and their 
individualism and I was wondering like that it reminded me of something you said earlier like does that would you see that manifesting in any way even as early as this Oh yeah, because the Romantic period is, you know, in the 19th, starts in the 19th century, right? So yeah, Tocqueville, Tocqueville talks about Romanticism in, and he actually talks about um, American literature and American, what we would probably call now like TV and film, American popular culture, democratic popular culture. There's some really amazing things to say about it. Um, there's so many interesting things. One of the things he says is, that in um, in democracy, literature becomes an industry, right? And so I don't know if you ever go to an airport or something, or you see like James Patterson, the novelist. Uh, there's actually a, I actually watched a show, um, uh, sixty Minutes on CBS. They visited him and they go into his study. He's probably best selling. Him and Stephen King are probably two, and and J.K. Rowling are the, probably the three best selling authors in the modern world in terms of the number of books sold and the amount of money made. They walk into his study and there's four manuscripts on the wall and he, he works on the manuscripts a little bit at a time every day. It's like a production line. You compare that to you know 19th century or 18th century novelists who spent you know 10 years on one book, right? So literature gets produced in this sort of industrial way Tocqueville says, uh, goods, goods get produced in an industrial way. And they're always about convenience and they're always about being more convenient and cheaper. Which seems unfortunate comparatively and a little bit surprising because you would think like under aristocracy, you, you would feel like that would be more um, industrialized, but actually, um, in history class, we've been studying the Industrial Revolution, etc., very recently. So I have that on my mind a lot. But just feel like it's surprising that in a culture that values each people's different thoughts, or at least professes to, their thoughts become commercial material. Yeah, uh, sure. I forget. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Jay. Um, I forget who it was who I was reading. Um. It may have been Tocqueville, but they were talking about how with the sort of in this time period, with the invention of the printing press, uh, and Tocqueville touches upon this in what we read, how there were, it wasn't that with the printing press, less, more stuff was made. And it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't even necessarily the stuff made was uh, bad stuff. It wasn't necessarily... Uh, low quality work it was all good work but none of it great works none of it perfect works and then when you look at like i personally love uh, dante's divine comedy i think it's one of the greatest works of art in it ever created and just something like that that he spent years and years on versus you might have an amazing work of literature that an artist only spent uh six eight months on it, it'll still be a good work of literature but it's not going to have the same thought, the same level of care. And then on top of that, because, sorry, I know this is a bit of a lot, but um, because of um, how much stuff there is, it's too almost too much for people to have. Like back in the day when people would have, you know, they'd memorize the Psalms, they'd go to mass and read the Bible and they'd have their fairy tales. But other than that, it wouldn't be much, but they would draw from it those core truths that they need instead of reading one thing, another thing, another thing, in, in taking all this media and losing some of what's in it because it's just so much. Sorry, that was a bit of a lot. No, but, it, but it's an important point because the, the point that I think uh, Sasha made in the comments about, you know, well, at least you have the freedom to produce books now in a way that you didn't before. It's absolutely true. And that's one of the things Tocqueville says, if we could just combine that advantage of democracy with the production of profound works, we really could have the best of both. But he says, but you, that requires constant attention and education in the classics. So you keep that spark alive. Um, classic literature, classic theater, classic science, classic philosophy, all of that, he says, you have to keep it alive. Otherwise you end up reducing literature, reducing science, reducing everything to convenience. He says, Democrat, because he's, look, democratic human beings are still human beings. 
So as human beings, they care about the true, the good, and the beautiful. But the problem is they always want the beautiful to be useful, even the beautiful. Like democratic people are like, that's really cool, but what can I do with it? Wow, that's so beautiful. But they don't pause and really contemplate it deep. They're like, oh yeah, beautiful sunset. Now let's go back to work. Or, or be- yeah, cool book, but let's get back to doing something serious again. Um, and you know this because, well, not your families, because if you're involved with CLT, your families and you know the importance of the classics in this. But next time you go talk to somebody and say, yeah, I'm going to be a philosophy major in college. See what the ordinary person says, right? Their answer to that is, their question is, what are you going to do with that? That's a very dem- That's a very democratic question. What's that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of, uh, as you said, Jacob, utilitarianism, that kind of useful as human beings, we are moved by the beautiful, but it doesn't grab a hold of our souls and hearts and minds, Tocqueville says in the way that it would for aristocracy. The advantage of it though, is we produce a lot of useful stuff, Mm -hmm. but the disadvantage is we, the danger is we could lose profound things, truly deep things, truly beautiful things. And that's actually how he ends the book. Just wanted to end by this reading this last little part here on six, page 675 in the right column. He says, as for myself, having come to the final stage of my course to discover from afar, but at once, all the diverse objects that I had contemplated separately in advancing, I feel full of fears and full of hopes. I see great perils that it is possible to ward off, great evils that one can avoid or restrain, And I become more and more firm in the belief that to be honest and prosperous, it is still enough for democratic nations to wish it. So he ends the book by saying, there's hope. The fear is we'll just continue this slide in the wrong direction and not really push back against the bad things and vices of democracy. The hope is there's still time and we can direct democracy toward the good things. As a human, as a democratic human being, you probably can't go around acting like an aristocrat. It would be a little weird uh, and almost impossible, but you could still read great literature. You can still think great thoughts. You can still be involved with classics. And he says that means we can still have the hope that there can be human greatness still in a democratic society. And he says, it's up to us really to make sure that that's what happens. So I, I, it's nice to leave. It's nice to end, I think, on a hopeful note. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, this conversation, I love all the places it's gone and, and uh, just rings true to the experience of reading and thinking about the Tocqueville, I think, where it's surprising the thoughts it can lead you to have. And then it's even more surprising to realize he like really specifically addresses them somehow, even very contemporary issues. Um, you all have been so thoughtful. Thank you, each one of you. And Dr. Sakingo, thank you for your time. Um, we're 10 minutes over now, so we'll have to we'll have to call it, call it quits, but we ended at the end. So that's good. Thank you so much for having me, Natalie. Appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate all of you you coming. Dr. Klask, one more question to you. Sorry. It's for if it's permitted, I'll answer it. Uh is is that fine? Yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, does Tocqueville specifically state whether uh, aristocracy or democracy is generally more inclined towards virtue? I've heard it said in the past that um, our ancestors were more, or I guess our political ancestors, aristocrats were more inclined to the harder virtues, like something like, for instance, charity, where they're giving somebody what is best for them, no matter the pain it might give to that person. While, uh, us Democrats, us modern people are more inclined to the weaker virtue, something like kindness, like giving somebody what feels the best, even if it's not necessarily what is best for them. Do you think that something like that, it shows that an aristocracy is something more generally inclined to virtue as a society? It's more inclined to the highest virtues, I think. In fact, that Tocqueville says in the bottom of 674 and top of 675, he says, It is natural to believe that what most satisfied the regard of 
this creator, he's talking about God, and preserver of men is not the singular prosperity of some. That's what aristocrats aim at, right? The highest of all for just a few. But the greatest well-being of all, what seems to me decadence is therefore progress in God's eyes. What wounds me is agreeable to him. Equality is perhaps less elevated, but it is more just, and its justice makes for its greatness and its beauty. Thank you, Sasha, Micaiah, and Jacob for your contributions. It's really been a pleasure. Um, thank you again. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you.